Well, a as you can see, uh, most of us started with four and yeah. worked up from there, you know. And, and, and like him, I guess I was always 10, 12 years behind state of the art. But state of the art wasn't what I was concerned yeah. with. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think if there's one word that all of us thought about was performance. That's right. That's it. If, if we could find a good performance and if we could preserve a good performance, we'd done a job. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and uh, yeah. luckily for all of us, we got to work with really great people. Yeah. And, and boy, if you don't think that makes a difference, try it without them. <laughs> <laughs> performances go on, on, you know, like there was a technical glitch or something that made the mm -hmm. performance not usable or something like that. You had to really have your act together to, to get a good mm -hmm. balance, to make sure the vocal was impactful, well, to make sure that whatever the main well, support I, is. Yeah, I, I would guess that if after the recording was finished, you couldn't tell I was involved, I'd done my job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I presented mm -hmm. the artist. Mm -hmm. I presented right. the performance. And if you messed up, you, you would be a scapegoat. <laughs> we yeah, well, the credit, you know? yeah, well, it, it comes with the territory. I, <laughs> I, 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 would, I never was anybody to worried about what other people thought. Yeah, in how that did you sense. set up the band? How did you set up like the? Well, the first room was small, fifteen by seventeen. So once you got past three people, you know, you were starting to move people around and think about which microphone to use and where to put this guy and where to put that guy. And Baffles. Was, yeah. <laughs> well, I had one. <laughs> and and uh, but it was on wheels, so I could move it around. Yeah. But uh, to me, uh, that that business of being transparent was was the the goal. And 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 I think uh, most of the artists I recorded would feel that I'd done my job, which was to get out of the way, so to speak. The uh, and of course the technology. You know, I mean, I started recording direct to disc, which meant not only you you, you didn't edit. But you didn't do too many takes either because the, the guy you were working for was looking at you burning up all those big expensive discs. <laughs> and, uh, you, so so you had to Joe be, was telling me earlier that they used to record to wax, and if the, the take didn't work out, they would just shave off the top layer of wax. wax. Nice yeah, well, I, I didn't. I, 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 had, a, I had a Presto 28N, uh, which was two Presto uh, uh, record, disc recorders, and recorded two at a time. One was the master and the other the safety, because in the old days the the to play a master would ruin it. So uh, I'd play the safety and and pray that the master was as good. Were, were they both running the same speed? Everything, yes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. identical. But you know, uh, I, I get back to that word performance. We we we've all been blessed with with great players, and boy, it, it makes your job n not just not work, but fun, yeah. and, 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 and literally, I mean, to, to spend a lifetime you running a recording to to studio. Were you excited to go to work when you, went, when you were going to work for Bartholomew or for Smiley Well, or no, I, I recorded when other people wanted. Uh, I used to do a lot of Sunday sessions with Dave Bartholomew because he, for some reason or other, always had something else he wanted to do <coughs> after we had done whatever we did during the week. So a lot of times we did Sunday things, and also, I got Cajun bands to come in on Saturdays and Sundays because they had, we had their jobs, you know, back in wherever in South Louisiana. So they would come on on uh, Saturday or a Sunday to, to record, and uh, and they were great. They'd bring hampers of crabs and stuff. <laughs> it, was a, it, was a, it was a fun time. Beer? Yeah. Well, um, beer is the mother's milk of recording, mm -hmm. I think. <laughs> That's right. That's right. For everybody. Yeah. 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 I know but, Mark has a great kitchen in his studio. It seems to be like a big part of it. Yeah. Well, uh, it, it, yeah. if you're gonna if you're gonna have guys uh, over a pr protracted period of time, uh, their comfort, whatever that takes, is crucial because if, if they get out of sorts, bye bye performance. You know. So, so you want them happy. My thing was to tell jokes. Yeah, so you try to keep them happy. Yeah, I still tell jokes. You know. But uh, <laughs> how do you do? You have to be a storyteller to go yeah, in a record producer. Yeah, and and uh, and it was fun, literally. And and uh, I, I think one of the really great 
things in, in the recording business that, that I found was once you got to know the guys in the band, suddenly the music was different. You, you, were, you were understanding what they were trying to do at that point. And, and that, can, that can be a little bit uh, uh, hair-raising sometimes uh, in that uh, you're not sure you're doing what they need done, you know? It, for whatever the New Orleans sound or da-da-da-da, you want to sure. call it, there was one thing that convinced me that the reason the players were good in New Orleans was a lot of people hired live bands for private functions. And if you were bad this week, you didn't play next week. Mm. So they, they filtered out the bad players mm. by not hiring them over. So what you got and, and what presented themselves as musicians most of the time in New Orleans were guys who'd proven themselves Saturday by Saturday, you know. And, and, and there, was no, there was no way you could say uh, that uh, he didn't have his chops because he earned them, you know. When did other studios start popping up in, in New Orleans? Oh, they came and they went. I, don't, I didn't pay attention to them, literally. Yeah. Um, in the early days, besides me, there was a, a studio that uh, a couple of uh, people from WWL had put up. Uh, they were doing air checks because back in those days, advertisers wanted to know that their commercial was played all the way through and didn't. Didn't get and so air checks was a big business and that's what they did literally so they had the facility and they did some recording and uh, uh, except for that un until the technology became a little bit more flexible tape machines and stuff like that uh, for instance when I got my first tape machine a quarter inch mono machine that was a revelation you could actually cut something out of a piece of tape and put it somewhere else. 351 Ampex? I, I had a, a first one was a 200. Okay. That's that was the Ampex as well? Huge, Observe. huge machine. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, the one I had was, quote, a, 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 a portable. It came in three trunks. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was the most hilarious thing you ever saw when we went on a, on a, on a date somewhere, you know. And... Uh, but the transport, it was one place, the amplifiers were another, and the power supplies were another little box. But it worked good. That's the main thing. And, and, it, and the, uh, the facility, uh, what, what you, get, you get caught. What year was that? Oh, wow. Let's see. I, I opened a studio in 45. I started serious recordings in 47. This had to be, I'd say, 58, 59. We got a mono tape machine. Do you have a magna cord? Do you ever have a magna cord? No, I had Ampex, but uh, magna cords were, were, were popular. Yeah. Uh, I had some clients who owned magna cords and they went around the countryside recording because it was portable. And, yeah. You know, yeah, and, that's what and, I use. Yeah. Cord yeah. In the studio. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and it was a good machine. Uh, and, and thankfully, not quite as bulky. I, I wasn't a producer in that sense at all. Uh, there were maybe three artists that I, quote, produced because somebody needed to yeah. to get them going, you know, but that was it. Yeah. But at some point you got into the well, record business. Well, I, I got into the record business because uh, the uh, record companies were notoriously bad payers. When I started off, a recording contract was a page. One page letticized, not even legally, <laughs> and, and it had very little to say, actually. And uh, now there are 100 pages, and, and really what they do is they give you the money on page one and they take it back in the other 99. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's it. Uh, well, uh, uh, the, now it's a project, and they do an album, then they do a video, and then they do a tour. The, the work of Little Richard stands in the pantheon but I especially like, not especially, I like the work that he did with the Upsetters, uh -huh. which hasn't gotten nearly as much uh, recognition. Uh -huh. Did he record that in your studio? No. No? No. In, in fact, his whole career was, first he did gospel songs. He was still in Georgia, I guess. And then, I think, I think RCA was the label, but I'm not sure. 
and then he went uh, to Texas, and the guy there uh, brought him to New Orleans, and we put him together with that good back backing group, and, and, and the rest is what to say history, you know. Uh, and and in fact, uh, what's her name? Hart Roop's wife, Lee Roop, I think, was her name. Yeah. Got into the record business on the basis of the fact that uh, uh, some people need to be recorded that don't get recorded, kind of feeling, you know? And uh, all of you can look around and say, there's a group, this is a guy, this singer, you know, they ought to record them. The, the trouble is there's no, no room. It's, it's a steep, steep pyramid like this, and there's room for a few hit records at the top, and the rest just gets lost in the shuffle. And it's been like that, and I guess it will always be like that, you know, because every day there's a bunch of people out there in the recording studio, and none of them are trying to make B-sides. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing that I'd like to know, back when I, you cut a record, you hope you get it played, the distributors work with you, and you got a hit record. Now, and it may take three months to get up number one. Mexican Joe, I think, took three months to get up number one. Now, I see on TV, here's an album debuted at number one. Yeah. I mean, it's not even on sale, and it's already number one. Yeah. Now, somebody explain that to me. Yeah. <laughs> There's some money changing hands somewhere. Well, uh, you know, for instance, the, the title of the Billboard charts kept changing. Yeah, I know. You, you know the, yeah. what they what they call it because. Uh, 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 when when they when they first started uh, covering black music, you know, they, they couldn't figure out what to call it. They called it black music for about three. Call four, it race music. Three, when I went. Then in. they went. Then they went to race music, and then they cutified it. They called it sepia. Called it what? Yeah. 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 Sepia. Oh yeah. yeah. And, and and things like it. And 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 they, they've had that problem all along, and we have it till today. Only now the problem is, as he says. On the basis of the orders placed, they'll declare a record number one. Uh, yeah, Come it's on. about what ships. Yeah. It, now it, you don't know what ships back. No, no, <laughs> right. No. Good thing, yeah. Well, they used to use uh, Tunis One Spot to, uh, to put their charts on, but they were always about four weeks behind, wow. so they were never up to date on their charts. That's good, probably. Yeah. Charts didn't influence the sales. <laughs> Well, you know, uh, then they had the up and coming things. So they'd put a bullet on something coming up, but it was, you know, so far behind. Yeah, it. and then came that famous phrase, top 40. Yeah. You know, when, when you, when yeah, you well, got to 39, something marvelous happened. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, those were the good old days. I'm going to tell you something. All of that is gone. Yeah, let me tell you. Today, Mom, you can't Mabel, get a record Mom's played Mabel. on any radio station. Yeah, Mom's <laughs> Mabel has got a thing. It's about the good old days. She says, where were they? I was here. <laughs> you know, I don't know whether you remember the session that you did for Good Time Jazz of the George Lewis Band in 1950. Oh, Lord, which, yeah. Which I think was just one of the most amazingly well balanced, trying to capture the power of that rhythm machine. How did you do that with getting it all the well, presence and everything? Let me tell you. <laughs> you, you the magic word in there is George Lewis. It, 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 always, it always gets back to performers, you know, and, and in George Lewis' case, uh, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't stand for a bad record, you know, not, he, he wouldn't jump irate and say, you know, blankety blank, why'd you do that? He said, I beg your pardon, but, you know, that's, but the result is, the, the, the quality is, is, is uh, determined by the people who perform when they literally place themselves in charge. And and they do by 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 saying what's good, you know. And 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 in his case, what's good was really good. Yeah, but you must have had a really somehow you use that equipment to get that power on sound. Well, kind of thing. I, don't, I don't know if I said it. It was but, in his head. But but but, <laughs> but but what what I did was listen to the performance and then go in a control room and hope to make it sound like what they did. Did you have limiters? At, at one time, yeah. In, in fact, it, there was a monster limiter with four huge output tubes in there. I forget who made it. And it was the, the latest, greatest thing, you know? And, and I used that damn thing. And after Fair a while, child. I got... Huh? Fairchild? 
I think it was Fairchild, yeah. And, 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 and after a few weeks, I realized I was depending on that son of a bitch. You know, yeah, I said, do. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I didn't yeah. want to. I, you know, I, it, it, it's not, right, you know, right. not the way you do it, you know. Yeah. If the dynamics are cockeyed, you fix the dynamics in the performance, not in, with the damn machine. You know, I've always said a, an engineer can't make a hit record, but he can sure ruin one. Yeah. I mean, you, it's got to be on that side of the glass before you can get it in here. Yeah, right? I mean, yeah. if it's not in there, I don't care what you do in here, it's not going to yeah. you know. You can't manufacture heartbreak. No. I, mean, I think you know, some of the fix difficult it in the things, mix, like Cosmo said. That's when you get a producer that doesn't hear what you hear, <laughs> that's impossible. You know, they want to... You, you know... Uh, if you run across I, I've, I've, run, I've run across... In fact, in my whole career, I only once fired a producer. I actually put the guy out of the studio. <laughs> I couldn't stand him telling me what was going on when he wasn't hearing what was going on. And finally I said, you can leave, we'll do the record, otherwise everybody goes. And he left, because he knew he was stupid. <laughs> you know? And, 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 and uh, you know, it's just, it's just amazing uh, what some people, and especially today, I mean, everybody's a producer. You mentioned the magic words, record distributor. Uh, there was a guy in, in, in Nashville. In fact, he was the only Jew that had a country accent I ever met. <laughs> but but he, uh, he, uh, he, 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 we, they'd send him demos. And he'd call up and, and he'd mention demos, such and such. And he says, he says uh, I'm buying, I'm buying uh, 4000 I'm paying 3000 and that's the way the really big distributors did. They controlled the business back then. Between them and, and, and back when jukeboxes were important as, as, as sales, uh, the jukebox operators forced you to make records two minutes and 20 seconds, and two minutes and 30 seconds. If you were four minutes, they wouldn't buy it for the, for the obvious reason. It'd take too long to get back to the next nickel, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, 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 uh, yeah. And the radio stations didn't want to play them either. But no. Because they well, could get more records in if they were a minute and a half. Or a also, af a after a while, some of the DJs, the, the more popular ones, got the feeling like they were producers. You know, how many times you take a record to a guy, a DJ, and he'd play it, and, 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 and uh, before you went on the air, I mean, he'd play it to listen to it, and he'd say, I'm hearing strings. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait. This record ought to have strings. It ain't come on the air yet. And, and he's already. He's he's, too he's, long. He's too long. Too, yeah, long. too yeah. short. It's not too, funny too short, enough. Too long. Yeah. Not funny enough. Yeah. 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 Some romance.